Thanks. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, good to talk to you again. Um, yeah, so today is the uh, final session, the fifth of five, uh, discussing Vault PLM and how it can help your uh, product lifecycle processes. Um, today, we're talking about uh, managing supplier information. So <clears throat> if this is the first one you've stumbled across, um, there are uh, four previous parts to this. Um, we've talked about uh, the need for both PDM and PLM uh, in the product uh, development and production process. Um, that was way back on February 10th. Um, then we spent the next three weeks talking about specific areas of PLM and PDM, uh, focusing on change in quality, bills of material, um, new product introduction, and today, the final installment, uh, we're going to be talking about managing supplier information. Right. So that's what's on the agenda today. And specifically, we're going to be talking about um, how to provide uh, a secure and direct means of information exchange with suppliers, with contractors, um, ways you can maintain and audit uh, the people that supply you product uh, products, um, how you can link bills of material components to supplier information to, uh, you know, things like cost and part number and information about what you buy from people. Um, and then we'll see how you can even get uh, suppliers and third parties uh, directly involved in your business processes to cut out things like, you know, emails and phone calls that can um, lead to lost information and confusion. So before we get started into what specifically Vault PLM can do, um, I'd like to provide a little context for today's presentation. Um, now, these days, we are under constant pressure to um, deliver things faster and cheaper, um, but at the same time, uh, the people that buy our products expect them to be better, right? More features, better quality, uh, longer lasting. And so, um, you know, these demands, they come with a lot of pressures. Uh, and those pressures can be particularly acute when we're dealing with parts of our product that we don't have complete control over. Um, namely, when we have something made by someone else, whether it's a off the shelf component we're buying, whether it's a, a, a supplier, you know, a contract manufacturer, um, you know, that can be a big unknown in the product delivery process. Um, you know, we need to manage uh, the people that supply us product that we in turn supply to our customers. Um, you know, we've got to buy that stuff. Uh, the people in procurement do a great job of paying for themselves. Um, we often need to trace what it is we buy, uh, depending on the industry that you're in. There may be specific uh, regulatory requirements. Um, it may be as important as being able to, you know, get information to feed our own quality processes. So if we have material failures, we need to know where did that material come from, and um, you know, do we have other uh, units somewhere that might have used it and might have a problem. Um, and then, of course, collaboration, right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit uh, in a minute about increasing globalization, um, you know, distribution of workforces, and um, collaboration is becoming a real challenge um, in today's world. So, as we go through today's presentation, um, I'd like you to think about how you avoid issues with your suppliers today, um, or if you have not been able to avoid some of them, the impact that those problems have had, right? Um, because today we're going to be talking about you know, ways in general, I would say, that you can help avoid problems with suppliers. Um, but I think it'll help put it all in context if you can think about specific examples where you've had issues with contract manufacturers or purchase components that didn't quite live up to what you were supposed to be getting and then, you know, therefore cause problems downstream in your own organization. So um, think about that. And um, today we're going to be talking about how the Vault PLM solution can help address those problems. 
And there are three sort of pillars to how uh, this software solution would help with that. The first one would be proper management of data. Um, centralizing the data in one location, providing a single source of the truth, so that if somebody has a question, um, if there's a process that needs information, um, that can all be managed you know, in a centralized location. Um, so data is a big part of it. The second would be processes, improving processes, using software for, to facilitate processes, providing visibility into processes, um, speeding them up, you know, foregoing four, five, six meetings in a week when you can just review data offline, you know, you know, at your own work schedule, respond, and now you don't have to, you know, carve out a half hour here and stop what you were doing just to talk about something that really could have been solved by, you know, reviewing some information in Fusion Lifecycle and making a decision, right? Um, and then finally, a real big part of today's presentation is going to be about extending the value of this data uh, to people outside the organization, working with people outside the organization, getting them involved in your processes, right? So the people pillar of the Vault PLM solution is going to be a, a real big focus of today's presentation. And to share some uh, information about, you know, I said a, a minute ago about increasing globalization and, um, you know, the whole, the pressures we feel about getting things done faster and better and cheaper. Um, Autodesk through Tech Data has done some research, you know, in, in 2019, they found that um, more than a third of people who responded to companies that responded to the survey um, have increased contract manufacturing, right? Um, and the majority of respondents reported that they have frequent changes to manufacturing partners or uh, parts of their supply chain, right? Again, uh, the procurement folks, um, they got to pay for themselves, right? They're always looking for, um, you know, the best deal that can, you know, meet the specific requirements uh, of a given part. Um, and that leads to, you know, multiple options a lot of times for, you know, procuring components and um, those things need to be vetted. The suppliers need to be vetted. Um, everyone needs to know, you know, when and how we're buying these things and ideally what they cost. And, you know, when we produce certain units, we need to know who we bought them from at that point in time, right? There's a, a lot that goes into a changing supply chain um, that if that's not managed properly uh, can cause a lot of downstream problems, right? Um, but in addition to, you know, contract manufacturing and supply chain, um, changes. We've also seen that 56% um, of those companies surveyed um, have seen an increase in globalization and customization. And I can I can attest to this anecdotally, at least, uh, with the companies that I talk to every day. Um, at the very least, within here within the U.S., you know, companies have multiple locations through acquisition or just, you know, Heck, during the pandemic, people spreading out, right? Um, but then also globalization, um, having things made in China, having design work done in India, um, that is increasingly common, even for smaller businesses, because uh, in general, communication has improved a bit. Um, manufacturing capability in China is fantastic. Um, there's lots of great resources in India for design work um, and lots of general IT type work. So, um, Companies are, are, if nothing else, being forced to, to find lower cost uh, solutions to some of their problems, right? And that is leading to increased globalization. Right. So what we're going to talk about today is a pretty software specific way through Vault PLM to help you address some of these challenges. Um, and specifically the supplier collaboration and management elements of the Vault PLM solution. Um, we're going to show um, how we can figure out, you know, which suppliers we're using and, and be confident we're using the right ones. Um, 
And rather than relying on tribal knowledge or uh, an email inbox or notes somewhere, um, you know, you can find up-to-date information about the suppliers you work with um, and make sure that you're making the right decision uh, when it comes time to decide where you're buying something and, and how you get it. Um, managing compliance. Um, there are increasing demands for not only regulatory requirements, but uh, ethical requirements, uh, you know, not sourcing conflict minerals, uh, making sure that, um, you know, labor sources are, are sourced ethically. Um, you know, it can be important at times to be able to prove that. And the Vault PLM solution has some great uh, tools to make sure that that information is getting captured and is visible when necessary. Um, and then capturing information straight from the source, right? Rather than relying on information passed through a phone call, then through an email and to the person who has to maybe make a decision, we can have the originator of that information participate in the system. Even third parties, people outside of our organization, outside of our firewall, can participate, provide feedback, um, and so we're not, uh, nothing gets lost in translation. So over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the Vault PLM solution. We've talked about these other things you see up here on the screen, new product introduction, enterprise bomb management, change management quality. Um, the final pillar here in the list is supplier collaboration. Again, that's today's focus. Um, and we're gonna talk at the beginning of the product process or toward the beginning, I should say, when we're really in the, in the product design phase. Um, and you're probably familiar with these icons down here if you're familiar with Autodesk products, Vault being really the focus of this part of the presentation. Um, involved heavily during the product development process. And there are challenges um, that arise in that process, the product design process, um, when you're working with contract manufacturers, uh, suppliers, even if you've got customers where you're customizing you know, the solution for them and you need their feedback and their approval and their review, um, there are real challenges to capturing that information and collaborating. So we're gonna take a look at, you know, how Vault um, can help that part of the process. So product data, that part of, you know, this um, supplier management capabilities, what we're talking about next, right? So again, we're starting with the data. So when it comes to getting feedback or buy-in from a customer um, or collaborating with a supplier to make sure they understand uh, the specific needs of, of what they're building for you, um, you know, we really need to do our best to simplify how we review things with customers or suppliers, um, make sure that happens faster. You know, email is not a great way to communicate. Um, in-person meetings these days are virtually impossible in most parts of the country, at least. Um, and, you know, schedules and globalization. And um, I, I'm in California. I have lots of really early meetings with people on the East Coast or in Europe. Um, so if there are ways you can factor out these things, uh, so much the better. And Vault can really help you with that. Um, through the idea of shared views. Now, this is something that's been in the Vault environment uh, and in CAD products and Venture and AutoCAD for a few years now, but I'm not sure that a lot of people know about it or take advantage of it. So if you ever do have to get feedback from people that are outside your environment, uh, people that do not have direct access to your Vault, shared views are a fantastic way uh, to provide them uh, the means to communicate to review designs, to uh, sign off on designs, to comment, et cetera, right? Um, the idea is you publish either a 2D or a 3D view of a design, it goes on the web, there's secure access, only those with access to the link can find it and see it. Um, you can collect comments about those things and then you can actually see that feedback right inside your design products, your vaults, Inventor and, and AutoCAD, right? So that's one way. 
that we can improve the, the collaboration process. Um, the other way is if you need to work with direct native CAD data, right? Again, Vault is not designed to be accessed outside the firewall. Um, but if you've got design contractors uh, specifically, um, but also if suppliers or even customers, if you do need to share your native data, um, a lot of times you might resort to a pack and go in an email or an FTP site because you know uh, uh, even an average size in venture design is usually going to be too big for email systems, right? So um, we need a good way to share this data with while keeping our environment secure, right? And we can do that through synchronizing Vault data with the cloud using Autodesk's cloud storage solution. Um, you might have heard to it in the past referred to as Fusion Team. It's now more part of the overall Fusion. Uh, you know, ecosystem where it's more than just cloud file storage that you might have like on Dropbox um, or OneDrive. It really is CAD aware, and we're going to see this in a second, where it's not just storage, it's here's a drawing, here's what that drawing uses, and now I need to get access to that native data. And as long as I have access permissions, which can be controlled, I can get that native data very easily. So let's take a quick look now at uh, Vault and how it can help with this collaboration. I'm going to start with the idea of shared views, right? So um, I have a, an inventor assembly here, and I need some feedback from my customer on that. Now, I could, uh, especially since it's 3D, um, I could save a 3D PDF. Uh, in my experience, those aren't typically great. Um, I could create a DWF, but then the customer needs to download design review. Um, it's going to be much more effective for me to use the shared view functionality. So I can share this view. When we share views, we can control whether we're including things like part properties and component names so we can somewhat anonymize the information. We're not sending the native data, right? So it's not something that someone could take this file and then you know, uh, necessarily reverse engineer it. Obviously they can see it, right? But they won't have, um, you know, highly accurate BREP data on it. Now, this is a small assembly. It literally takes a few seconds to share this. A larger assembly might take longer, but it does happen pretty quickly. Um, and when this is done, you get the ability to send a link uh, to someone. Um, I'm just gonna open it up right in the browser here. And straight away, I have access now to a 3D view of this assembly in my browser, right? And this is using, you know, the Autodesk, you know, web viewer. Um, we can pan, zoom, rotate. Um, we can, you know, interact with the, the model. We can take measurements. Um, we might even be able to explode this, right? So this is just an amazing viewer. So literally two clicks in Vault and then a click to load it up in a browser or copy and paste into an email. And you can have a customer, you know, directly interacting with one of your models so they can view this thing and vet it. Right. Now, if they need to provide some feedback, they can actually do a markup. And in this case, this is gonna take essentially a, almost like a little screen capture um, of this, um, where I can actually do a markup I can draw on this, I can add text, et cetera. And when I save this markup, I get the opportunity. You'll see now comments. I can make a general comment about something. This is actually my markup, right? And you'll notice a little resolve checkbox here. This is one of the coolest things apart about this whole interaction, I think. This is essentially um, like a, a many issues list, right? Here's something that I've identified is, is potentially a problem, right? And what's super cool about this is now if I go back and look in my vaults and I look at this component, I can actually see this markup in the system, right? And I can see in this case, this one is specifically, it is resolved. Um, but I can now review this. I could see what the customer had to say. I could reply to it. Um, and we've got that history. And that 
whole idea of the shared view and the markup, um, it only stays online for 30 days and then it automatically will disappear. Now we could certainly, um, we can certainly extend that if we need to, but it's a very safe way to communicate with a customer. It's not gonna stick around absolutely forever um, so that your data is ultimately protected, but you still have access to that right inside your product. That also is available in Inventor, by the way. You can share a view straight from Inventor as well. So the shared views, if you're not using them, I, I highly recommend them. It's a great way to communicate. So um, now, if that's not enough, if you really need to provide access to the native data, um, there's another way you can do that. Um, traditionally, like I said, you might you might get the files from uh, from the vault and you know put them on an FTP site. Um, you might do a pack and go from vault, which is nice, but it um, then creates a zip file that then maybe you have to email. Um, and then, you know, eventually maybe a subcontractor does some work on it and they email it back to you. And then you've now got to get that information somehow back into your vault. This has been a problem literally for more than a decade. I've, I was talking with customers, you know, 15 years ago about, well, we're using vault. We have people that need to work outside our company. How do we get that data properly back in our vault? There are ways to do it in the absence of what I'm about to show you, but what you're about to see makes it much, much easier. Now I can actually take any of the data in my vault if I've configured it to use Autodesk's file storage in the cloud, I can upload data to a cloud drive, right? And this uses uh, a utility that would also be stored on a computer in our environment called the desktop connector. So essentially what it does is it triggers a job in Autodesk vault to, um, upload these files to a cloud site, right? So there's currently a job running on my computer that is uploading files to a cloud location. Right? So if we go over and take a look at that cloud location now, so this is my uh, Fusion team, uh, Fusion in general, I would say site. I've got a folder here. Um, and if I refresh my view, I might see this drawing here already. We'll see. Um, I don't think it is uploaded just yet, but I have an example. It usually takes maybe a couple minutes in the interest of time. So I'm going to show you something similar. So this is a drawing I uploaded yesterday. Um, and notice this is not just file storage. This looks an awful lot like Vault, right? We have our drawing. We have uses and where used information. Um, we have the concept of versions, right? So this currently is at version one. Um, notice similarly to the shared view, we have the ability to view and comment on this file. So this could also provide collaboration, right? So this drawing uses this assembly. This would let me get to that assembly within the file storage system here in the cloud. And if I need to get all the way down to a specific file in that assembly, let's say as the subcontractor, this is what I'm responsible for working on. If I need to work on this, notice this little open and desktop button over here. If I have Inventor open, well, even if I don't, I think it'll launch Inventor for me. If I hit that open and desktop button, that actually is gonna call up Inventor and open that file from the cloud directly onto my system. And notice the little cloud icon over here. Inventor knows this is a cloud file. So when I make the changes to this, it will update the cloud version of it. So rather than getting an email, saving it to some local place on my computer, um, doing the work, and then emailing it back, this is still on my local computer. This is using the desktop connector to get me a local copy so I can still work on it efficiently and effectively without lag to some cloud site. When I save my changes, it'll save it up to the cloud location. And then eventually, once, you know, me as the subcontractor, once my customer, you know, the person who's using Vault in this case, once they're ready, they can download from the cloud drive. They could choose to download 
that specifically now updated file. Or if it's the kind of thing where I am responsible for a whole bunch of work for them, they can actually sync up in the vault. We can create synchronization to where every so often vault actually just fetches the files from uh, from the cloud location. Right. So between shared views and synchronizing to cloud drives, um, there are great ways to collaborate. Um, and that is part of the, the uh, vault product line today. Right. So uh, a couple questions about this. Um, what if the supplier doesn't have Inventor, instead they use SolidWorks? Um, that's a good question. I don't, if it's a single part, I expect the file would just synchronize up and synchronize back. Um, I'm not 100% I'm not sure if the desktop connector understands SolidWorks file relationships. I think it might, um, but I'll get, uh, I have your question here, I'll get back to you with some more information about how well it might support other CAD formats. Um, and then another question, how do you get it back into Vault under the same part number but a new revision? So when you down either synchronize from the cloud or specifically download a file from the cloud drive, um, it will create a new version of that file in your Vault. So what you would do is before you download from the cloud drive, right, you would um, change the state, you know, you would, you know, undergo revision here. So you'd go from, you know, one of these files that actually have, you know, released, let's say. Um, and this is just, you know, basic vault work. If it's released Rev A, and I'm gonna revise it based on what a subcontractor has done for me, you know, I would just change state, put it into WIP. It's gonna bump the Rev. Then I would synchronize from, from the cloud drive. I would download it, creating a new version of this file in the vault that becomes, you know, version, you know, whatever, 14. And then I would take that new file version through the rest of my lifecycle process. So um, it really is just a, a couple of clicks or even automatic synchronization. Um, so it's, I think it's a killer way to collaborate, frankly. All right, so let's move on to the next pillar of this whole um, collaboration process, which is people, getting people involved, right? Um, so one of the great things about Fusion Lifecycle is that it runs in a browser. That means like any browser, any modern browser, um, be it on a phone, a tablet, on a PC, um, Windows, uh, Mac OS, Chrome OS, if it's got a browser, you can access Fusion Lifecycle, right? Um, if you need to go and look something up, it's all in the system, you need to participate, you can do everything you need to do through that browser, right? Um, now, when we're talking about people, right, and, you know, dealing with people outside of our organization, um, we need to make sure who we're doing business with is meeting our requirements. Um, we need to make sure the parts they supply us are meeting requirements that are meeting spec. Um, and what we can do on the PLM side of the Vault PLM solution through Fusion Lifecycle, we can manage the suppliers that we work with. We can make sure we have up-to-date information about them. If we have an issue with that supplier, who should we contact? Who is their backup, right? We can store all of that information in Fusion Lifecycle so that everyone can see it, not just maybe the people who run ERP, but if an engineer has an issue with a supplier, they could get that information through PLM, for example. Right? Um, you don't have to call up a spreadsheet, there's not a, a bunch of emails, right? Um, if we need to periodically review our suppliers on some sort of cycle, we can set that up in Fusion Lifecycle so that you know every 12 months, um, uh, a task comes due to you know perform an audit, right? Um, so right here you see like a list of components. We're gonna, our suppliers are going to take an actual look at the product here in a second and information about them. Um, but not only 
can you just have information about them? With Fusion Lifecycle, again, because it's cloud-based, accessible from anywhere, and because of its security model, you can actually invite suppliers to participate in your environment. So we have a very granular security model when it comes to information in Fusion Lifecycle. Um, you can get access to the entire tenant as an administrator. You can control access to individuals or groups at the workspace level, meaning they can see a workspace or not, workspace being a list of suppliers or uh, your items and bombs or your products. We can restrict access to specific records, um, specific tabs on those records, like maybe only the item information details, like the actual properties of the record or the bomb tab, and even down into specific sections within, say, the item details. So you do have what you need to invite people into your tenant, even if they're not actually part of your organization, because you can limit their permissions that lets them participate in workflow and actually update information. And there's an audit trail of every record change and who did it. So you can see exactly who changed that information and when. Right. So you could have a vendor come into the system and update whether or not the parts they supply to you are Rojas compliant or you know, compliant with your labor standards or conflict mineral uh, standards. Um, maybe they just need to see it. Maybe they need to participate in their own audit process, right? That yes, we've done, we've filled out this paperwork um, and now we're ready to move this on to the next part. We're ready for you to review it, right? So you don't have to wait on an email or a phone call. So let's take just a quick look inside uh, Fusion Lifecycle now. So we're looking at my Fusion Lifecycle dashboard. Um, we have an entire supply chain area uh, of the product. Right now I've got a list of suppliers up here. This list of suppliers can serve as uh, a pick list in other workspaces like We'll see in a second if I want to modify uh, who we buy a component from. I could add a supplier to the list and it would come straight from this list. So it's a real time list anytime I need to interact with that data. If we look at a specific supplier, we can see information about that supplier, phone number, uh, who our contacts are for the various you know, roles that we need to interact with, uh, links to any audit that they're currently undergoing, um, who is responsible for reviewing. There can be an entire approval workflow, right? And this is this is a flow, right? This is, um, they're currently active in the system. Um, if we need to deactivate them for some reason, we can. We could submit them back automatically to under review when their review period comes up, right? And if there are any non-conformances due to the products that they've supplied us, we could see them on a list here. So if nothing else, looking at that number up there in parentheses would tell you, wow, we have a lot of issues with what this, you know, this company supplies us. Maybe we should take a look at you know, our relationship with them. Right. Um, now, when it comes to integrating this information with our products, right? What we could actually do is we could grant them access to our system. So what I have over here on the left is uh, the view in Edge logged in as a supplier. On the right is an engineer's view that they would have in their own tenant, right? So as a supplier, you know I have less access to the system. You know my as an engineer over here, I've got you know, reports I can see and all that. The supplier, in this case, they don't work for us, they're outside our firewall, they're outside our organization, but we still need them to come and participate, right? And specifically, this is one of the products they sell us. And if we look at that same product over here on the right, what the supplier sees is just some basic information, like a summary, the classification for this thing, and, you know, environmental compliance, right? On the right, within our organization, an engineer, I can actually see the list of manufacturers, right? And who we buy this from, right? So we don't want 
other suppliers seeing this kind of information, like who else we buy it from. We absolutely don't ever want them to know that. But we want them to be able to come in and and manipulate this data if necessary, if they're the supplier that we're, you know, we're buying this from. Right? So as an engineer, I could come in and edit this and change all this information and pick from suppliers. This supplier has very limited access to what they can see. Right? This is part of the granular permission model. Uh, where you can make sure people have access to only what they should see and only what they should be able to edit. Okay, so that's the people part of the process. Um, now let's get to the process part of the process, <laughs> right? Um, I mentioned this a bit ago, um, but Every supplier we have in the system, we can actually have an entire process around vetting them and making sure that they are regularly reviewed, um, right? So we could have the idea of starting an audit in the system. We can do the review of them. We can actually have them participate in their own audit directly in the system. And if there's something wrong, if we need more information, we can reject it back through until eventually we work it out and they're good to go. Right now we're buying stuff from them. They're supplying it. Everything's good. Um, every six months or so, we just need to check in and make sure that the relationship is still good, that we're getting what we were promised and, you know, they're giving us the best deal. So we can actually trigger automatically uh, a new audit based on a certain time frame. Right now that's part of the default tenant. Um, but Fusion Lifecycle has this idea, also has this idea of the app store. Um, now, this what you're seeing here is um, the App Store as it was yesterday, I think. Um, there are lots of different apps here for different uh, needs. Um, there's a, a, a new new project introduction. We talked about that last week. There's a new uh, set of workflows for that. These apps are all uh, part of the product. They're optional whether or not you use them, and it will build out new workspaces and workflows and, and roles and permissions to use this functionality. Um, so essentially, it's just something that you turn on. Right now, in this specific case, there are a couple of really nice uh, apps that if you need more intensive supplier management, you can take advantage of, right? That would be the supplier quarterly business review and the supplier corrective action request. So the SQBR is a process. It's a much uh, more involved process than just asking some questions necessarily. Um, an entire workflow um, around vetting a supplier and making sure that your relationship is solid, right? So if we come and um, look at our supply chain, look at our SQBR, I just wanna show you the workflow here of one. And you can see there could be um, an entire process. There's, you know, how is the quality of the products you're getting? How is their performance? Um, are we getting a deal from them? How well do they support us, right? And this is a great workflow to use, especially if you're looking for something more intensive and you don't have anything like super well-defined. Um, this is a, a completely, well, I wouldn't say completely because you got to come up with numbers, but it's essentially, broken down into a series of, of objective reviews, you know, do they have any outstanding corrective actions? Um, you know, what's their reliability? Um, you know, what's their lead time then? Like some of these are actual quantitative things that you can come up with and provide a score on, and eventually it's gonna add up to some number to say, you know, what's their grade? Do they get an A, do they get an F? You know, should we keep doing business with them? Um, and so this is a great tool that you can essentially just turn on if you want. Um, similarly, the corrective action request. So when you do have at, you know issues with a supplier, um, and it's more than just a, a phone call to make sure that you know, yeah, it's late, it's going to be there tomorrow kind of thing. But it's you know this is now the third component that's come in um, that's been out of spec and. You know, we were able to make it work, but we really need to get to the root at why this is happening. Um, just like you might have a an internal corrective and preventive action process for your own internal issues, you could have a process managed through Fusion Lifecycle 
for issues you have with suppliers. Okay, so um, that is gonna do it for today. Um, just to review, um, we've talked about how Vault PLM can help you with your supply chain management issues um, by centralizing data, uh, by giving access to that data to people at the right time, even outside your organization, um, speeding up and improving processes. You know, we talked at the beginning of the presentation about always needing to, to deliver things faster uh, and cheaper, but also being better. Um, it used to be fast, good, cheap, pick two. Increasingly, we got to deliver on all three, right? And so Vault PLM uh, can certainly help you uh, with that. And so that wraps up today's presentation and uh, the overall series. So to review, we've talked about the need for PDM and PLM. Uh, we've talked about quality and change management, uh, items and bomb management, new product introduction processes, and today, supplier management. So um, if you've missed any of those and those topics sound of interest to you, um, they'll be available uh, on our website. Um, if not now, then soon. Um, and if you've got any questions about what Vault PLM can do for you or any, you know, about the specific webcast, please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, but now we'll turn this over to questions uh, about supplier management or really if you've got any questions about the Vault PLM environment, uh, go ahead and feel free to ask. Okay, we have had one question come in. Do you do you have to purchase Vault PLM separately from Fusion Lifecycle? That's a great question, actually. Um, so the way you could buy this overall solution, you can buy just Vault Professional on its own, and you may already own Vault Professional. Um, you can also buy Fusion Lifecycle on its own. Um, there is also a combination license that would get you a license of both. Um, and pricing changes, right? So I don't wanna give any specific numbers, but depending on how you have purchased Vault Professional recently, um, it could actually be just a very small incremental cost to move to Vault PLM. Um, you know, depending on exactly what your needs are and who needs access only to Vault, who needs access only to PLM, you know, you may need some combination of Vault only, Fusion Lifecycle only, or Vault PLM. So um, they are technically separate products that could be purchased separately, but there's a great opportunity to get both of them together because they really are designed to be part of a holistic product lifecycle management and product data management solution. Um, so another question, are all of those separate packages part of PLM? So um, that's a good question. PLM as an acronym can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, so I draw this distinction between PDM, product data management, and PLM, product lifecycle management. Now, there's lots of software in the world. Some software packages will technically do both um, under the same application. Um, in the Autodesk world, we have two different applications. We have Vault for the PDM side of things, and we have Fusion Lifecycle for the PLM side of things. Um, and I personally think that is a great way to approach it because um, PDM, is about 
largely about managing documents. And especially if we're talking about uh, CAD applications, um, Inventor, we've got lots of files. You need access to this data um, as local to your computer as possible, right? Um, and it's also the definition of your product. So with Vault, you can keep the data on premise to make sure you have fast, productive, safe access to it. But PLM, by necessity, extends across the entire enterprise, and as we've seen today, even outside the enterprise. And so having that as a cloud solution, hosted, secure, accessible from anywhere, makes a ton of sense. So this sort of hybrid approach, on-premise for the files, in the cloud for the process, to me, is fantastic. And there's absolutely a, a bridge between those two uh, to synchronize the information between them. Um, and also the fact that if you use Fusion Lifecycle for PLM, um, Fusion Lifecycle does fundamentally not care where your CAD data came from. It doesn't manage the CAD data inherently. And so if you've got a hybrid environment where you use different CAD products, Fusion Lifecycle can still be your PLM solution while you use the appropriate PDM solution for the CAD systems that you work with, right? So uh, there's tremendous flexibility in the environment. Um, I, I just think I love it. I think it's a, a fantastic way to approach things. Um, another question, the App Store, do the apps cost money? No, they do not. So if we take a look at the App Store here, um, all of these apps, um, I hesitate to say the word free uh, because free is often a loaded term. Um, all of these apps you see here are included as part of the product. They're just not enabled, right? Um, so if I want to start tracking accident reports via Fusion Lifecycle, um, I don't, it's not part of the default tenant, we call it. It's not part of the default functionality. But if I want to start putting it to use, I could just come here, click, press install. I'll just do it right here in front of you. Let's just do it live, right? Install it. This is going to create the necessary workspaces in my tenant and the pick lists and roles. And now all I have to do is go assign the roles to the appropriate people. And we're off and working, right? So it can be just that easy to enable one of these apps. All right. Um, right, so just to clarify too, someone raised a good point. Ideally, they would want, say, engineers in the company to have Vault and PLM access, but most of the rest of the company would only need the PLM, and that's absolutely a viable mix. Everyone who uses CAD could have a Vault PLM license, and then you could add some number of Fusion Lifecycle only licenses to the people that never touch the, the Vault environment, but need to participate in process, absolutely. All right, I don't think I've seen any other questions come in in the last couple of minutes. So uh, with that, Ashley, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, well, thank you, Forrest, and thank you everyone for attending and joining us for this series. Um, I will say that there will be a survey just pop up as we close down today. We appreciate you filling that out. And also just a reminder, you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of today's presentation. And have a great day, everyone.